You're listening to the Outpost Podcast with Dr. Ray Mitch. Well, greetings and welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Outpost Podcast. Uh, I'm Dr. Ray Mitch, your host, and uh, I'm thankful and and grateful that you took some time out to sit down or drive or listen to uh, the podcast itself. This podcast um, really is focusing on this intersection of faith, psychology, and spiritual formation, and and uh, that's that's a a wheelhouse of mine for sure. I've been doing a counseling. I've been in counseling and being a counselor for over forty years, and so I and I've been teaching for fifteen at uh, Colorado Christian University, and and uh, I, I started doing this. And this, to some degree, what we're getting into this month uh, is a series that is really where I started. I started um, doing this podcast. It was under uh, the the title, The Psych Monologues, many uh, three, now almost four years ago. Um, and it was really out of a, a need uh, to talk about grief and loss with my students who were going through grief and loss in 2020 uh, because of uh, aborted a spring semester and um, not getting graduation ceremonies and things like that. And so I, I took it upon myself to do this, uh, podcast and it really was speaking to them. And if anyone else wanted to listen in, they were more than welcome to do so. Well, the, what I want to do is I want to actually go back to the very beginning and talk a little bit about grief and loss. Now there's a reason for this. There's a lurking reason in the background and that is the the launch of a brand new book that I'm releasing um, and it will release on January 16th and I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, at the end of the the episode so <clears throat> the outpost podcast is is meant to look at these three major items outposts oftentimes are at the crossroads of things or intersections of things or roads and it's a safe place to sit and meet and talk and be known and and that's really what uh, the purpose behind this is is the outpost is is kind of a, a way station to hear new information and talk about different things that you may not have heard before and at least consider them and so what I want to start with is really a, a material that will fit nicely with uh, the release of my new book called The Seasons of Our Grief. Uh, And what I want to talk about is a little bit the background for talking about grief and loss. Um, It it seems like an odd topic. I will grant you that for doing it at the beginning of a year. You want to start out with good, happy vibes and all that good stuff. And yes and no. I I think that's one of those places where reality clashes with with uh, magical thinking or even hopeful thinking, if you want to use that word. I, I have another issue with that, but I'm not going to get into it now. So <clears throat> one of the reasons I want to get into this is not only to f- familiarize my listeners with some of what's going to be in the book, um, and it's different. It's it, And I will warn you ahead of time, just uh, if you're familiar with the term caveat emptor, what it means is buyer beware, uh, that, that the book is not going to be a direct teaching on grief and loss. It's actually going to give you an opportunity to walk with a couple different people as they walk through their grief and the experience of the losses that they have. And so the, the thing I want to make sure that we do and kind of broaden the horizon here a little bit is that the minute I start talking about this, people generally will think, well, I, I haven't lost anybody. I, I have No one's died in my life, so how is this relevant to me? The reality is, is losses involve a lot more than just somebody dying. And, and actually, if you look at some of our language, our language actually betrays that when you think about it. Um, because we say a dream has died, or... 
Um, I, I had my eye on a new job and that opportunity died. And so there are losses. And quite honestly, I don't think you can get through a week without a loss. I, I honestly don't. Um, the loss of expectations. I mean, I, going into uh, next week, we're going to start out with, with my classes that are coming up. And actually, one of the classes is the grief and loss class. And I inevitably ask the question, so what do you hope for? What do you expect? And uh, what are you afraid of? And that's you can take those same things and apply them as we're looking down this very long road called 2024. And I, I, there are some things that I want to begin to help you become aware of when we're talking about grief and loss going into a new year and, and maybe set some different expectations this time around uh, about what's coming up. Now, there are there's some context, though, that I think we have to have put that I have to put in place so that you, you understand where I'm going and what it, what it is I'm talking about. Because one of the biggest reasons I, I give for doing a class on grief and loss, which, by the way, you know, a lot of times students will all say, why would I want to take a class like that? It just sounds sad. But what they end up finding out is that maybe it isn't as sad as they thought. It is a re-education in what life is like on this earth, the the life that's broken. And it is um, cruelly even punctuated by loss. And so one of the biggest challenges that I have to overcome is, is that we don't tend to accept death as a reality. Um in, in years gone by, centuries gone by, there was something that would be referred to as a familiar death. You, you would see evidence of the, the people who have died in your family and in your town. You would see that all the time. You know, sometimes even some families would have their own cemetery. And so you'd literally walk out the front door and see your ancestors buried there. And, and before too long, uh, communities got together and they began to cre- create a community cemetery. And they, actually, it was probably the busiest place in town because it was a great place to meet other people and to talk about the, t- the things that are going on. And, and oftentimes, they're at the center of town, which you don't see anymore, really, at all. Now, what, what we have today, though, is what you might call a medicalized or sanitized death. So we have it, we, we've taken it into the hospital, and, and it then becomes the doctor's job to keep the patient alive, which means, by definition, when the patient dies, it is a failure of the doctor doing their job. And oftentimes, that's what family members feel, and doctors feel, I might add, but we've sanitized death, and and the, there's been a movement. Probably started if I if I'm remembering right, it started sometime in the '60s, uh, and it was called the hospice movement. And many of us are familiar with that. Um, it it, uh, it moved the people that were gravely ill, terminally ill, back home and and available and uh, around the people that they were most comfortable with and they they had the greatest love for and it it familiarized death to us uh and that's that's a better thing quite honestly i i think we we live life as if we're going to live forever and i i have a quote later uh from elizabeth kubler ross that i think is is probably the most uh, uh telling because of it coming from her near the end of her life and so we don't accept death as a reality, and, and quite honestly, we have no, we have never been taught how to grieve. I I I can't tell you how many times I've had people say this: is I, I've never done this before. What do I do? How do I how do I handle it? And what ends up happening is because we have no models for it, nothing that that points us in what's the quote-unquote appropriate way to grieve, which there isn't one. I'll just burst that bubble right now. But 
we don't know what we're doing, and so we survive. We just do whatever is necessary. Probably one of the most, um, I think, damaging things that, that have persisted even today is talking about stages of grief as if grief is something to accomplish. It, it's, it's to be checked off. You know, I get through stage one, I go to stage two, and then when I get through, through two, I get to three, and then when I get to four, I'm done, I'm resolved, and everything's fine. Uh, and if you talk to anybody who's been through the grief process that is, are, is honest with you, what you'll find is, yeah, no, it, it really doesn't work that way. It's never that linear. And that's usually what we always resort to, even when we're talking to somebody who's grieving, because we'll, we'll be quick to say, well, you're in denial and blah, blah, blah. But denial has a lot more to it than meets the eye, too. And, and that's, I, I think we have to kiss the monster on the nose here. We have to embrace the very thing that is the thing that we don't know what we're doing and walk through it and find people that have walked through it with us so that we we can accomplish this thing. So we, we don't accept death as a reality. It's not in our face all the time. We And, you know, with greater and greater lifespans, you know, it just doesn't happen as frequently, although it happens precipitously at a variety of times. I, I just, uh, we just had a good friend of our family that um, uh, her, her mom went to sleep and didn't wake up the next morning and she was hale and hearty and had a good um, medical report and everything, a doctor report and everything was fine. What looked like it was fine, but she didn't wake up. And the next morning, bam, it's all I were, what do I do now? And that it, it's stunning. It's and and in a lot of ways, grief is a lot like a psychological burn wound. And I talk about this in my first book called "Grieving the Loss of Someone You Love," where <clears throat> you you know if you se- sear your finger or burn your finger on a stove, right initially you don't feel anything, and then the nerves wake up, and then you wish. You, you wish for some relief some way. I mean, and you, you could do your pinky and it would keep you awake all night just from throbbing. And that's, and that's kind of what grief is like. It's, it's a psychological burn wound. And we have to be able to um, care for the wound well in order for it to heal well. And when we don't do that, we won't heal as well, quite honestly. And I, I've seen it way, way too often. So we don't accept death as a reality. So this is not real. This is not really happening. Uh, or we've never really been taught how to grieve. And that's taught by modeling or whatever. And and just to give you an example of that, when I was a kid and my dad died, um, uh, I was staying at my... A friend's house, and the little did I know that my friend's house and his parents were going to be my in-laws one day, someday later, and and so my mom came to the house and told me my dad had died, and um, and so arrangements were being made, and she was back at at, at the home that I was living in, and uh, my in-laws. Again, I didn't know that they were my in-laws, but um, Pat and Paul Williams w- took me and, and drove me to my home. And as I was going, Pat turned around and looked at me and said, now this is what you're going to have to do when people say that they're sorry that your dad died. And and this is how you accept. And she used a fancy word to me. It's very familiar to most of us. Is how do you accept condolences from people? Well, I had no idea. I was a 12-year-old, for crying out loud. So I, that was the closest thing I had to teaching me about grieving um, and what that actually looks like. So we've never been taught how to grieve. And usually, like I said before, grief has no predecessor. We haven't done it before. Now, unfortunately, and this is kind of the the weight of growing old is that you face it more and more as time goes along. You have people that die and you, you go through it each time 
And, and each time is different because of the history of the person that we have the relationship with. And so grief, it, it usually doesn't have a, a predecessor, usually. And, and then last but not least, and certainly not the least of it, is we see death as an enemy. In, in other words, life is discontinuous with death instead of it there being a continuity between one to the other. And if we see death as our enemy, then it is something to be resisted, to be avoided, to not talk about, to cloak in all sorts of euphemisms that come up, which is you know, part of the most annoying aspects to me of the whole grief process and, and having been a part of it and certainly having heard more than my share of it, where we we just come up with these crazy euphemisms like the person's passed away. Now, I understand, so let me just say right out of the gate, I understand what is meant. I don't, but I don't take what is meant. I take what's said. And the person has died. So why is it that we can't just flat out say the person's died? Because somehow we, we think we're going to rub off the sharp edges of reality. I, I, that's actually cruel, quite honestly, to the person who's experiencing the grief. It, it, it It's the reality that I have to try to accept somehow and grapple with. And saying that the person is just passed away or passed on or or you know they they've fallen asleep or what other any other strange euphemism you can come up with um I, is is not a path through grief it, it's a it's a side street in a lot of ways so what what i wanted to mention here is Elizabeth Kubler Ross jokingly said with her co author, she wrote a book and it was near the end of her life. It was called On Grief and Grieving. Um, a lot of people don't know that Elizabeth Kubler Ross's book on death and dying was actually a- about people that were dying, it wasn't about people that were grieving. And, and so she transferred that over into this book and she jokingly said at the end of her life, Maybe I should do a book on life and living. So she had death and dying and grief and grieving, and and she never got to finish that particular book. But she makes this comment, and, and she says, it is the denial of death that is personally responsible for people living empty, purposeless lives. For when you live as if you'll live forever, it becomes too easy to postpone things you know that you must do. And he, isn't that true? I mean, even even in the overabundant optimism with medical technology these days, it, it's even more the case that we have that. So it, it, it makes sense to me. Um, and of course, I set the agenda for the podcast, so this is what we're doing. It makes sense to me that to, to move into and look directly at the the pain of the absence of the person that we feel the most keenly at the beginning of the year. We're going to feel it all through the year. That doesn't mean that we feel it at the same intensity all through the year. And even sometimes we're reminded of them and then we get this pain and pang of intensity from it. But there's some there are what I want to do and and I'll probably just camp on this and then uh, we'll we'll continue on in the next episode, but there's some common misconceptions that have arisen around grief and grieving. The first one is the mistaken value of restraint, and this one in particular makes the grieving person responsible for the emotional well-being of the person who's supposed to be comforting them, and so we stuff it just simply we we make it so that it's not uncomfortable for somebody else how often have you done this or i do this a lot less i than i ever have before but how often have you been around somebody or maybe you've done it when 
tears have bubbled to the surface because of a loss or something like that. Whatever it is. I mean, I just had somebody in a group that I attended talk about losing an animal. And and the tears bubbled to the surface. And the first thing that comes out of the person's mouth is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why? Why? Because the animal or the person held such a dear place in your heart that the tears that you shed are something to apologize for? No, I don't. I don't buy it. And that's one of the reasons why, even when I do this class, I'm sure that I will get tearful about the number of people that we have lost already in the last five years or so. And and I, I say very specifically, I will not apologize for my tears for because they are a symbol of the love that I had for those people and animal. Uh, within the last year and a half, we we say goodbye to our golden retriever of 16 years. It was very, very painful. And I think everybody knows who's lost an animal that that's, that's a unique kind of pain in a lot of ways. So the, the, there's a mistaken value of restraint. And, and in other cultures, they don't have any problem at, you know, the, the, for lack of a better way to put it, the gnashing of teeth, the wailing and the weeping and out in the open, out in the open. They don't think a thing about it. And somewhere we've gotten this notion that somehow I'm being weak if I show my emotion like that or if I lose control. I mean, think about this. We've got all of these words and phrases like I'm falling apart or I'm losing control or I'm losing it or things like that that convey and bring with them a fair amount of shame in in the face of being thoroughly human. So there's that first one, and it's a misconception that we have. Another one is that if I let this come up and show itself, it will bowl me over indefinitely, and I will never get over it. And... <clears throat> while that is entirely understandable, it is um, uh, it's unrealistic, but it doesn't matter that it's unrealistic. It motivates our behavior most of the time when we're talking about grief. Is I, I don't want to crack that door open because when I crack it open, everything will come rolling out and I won't be able to control what? My emotions? Or I won't be able to control what the other person thinks or what conclusions they make about how strong or weak I am. Of course, I've already made those conclusions myself anyway, right? And so this and this goes along with it, the whole under the misunderstanding of tears is somehow tears is an indication of my weakness rather than tears being a communication of my love for the person, for for the animal, like I said. Another one is that if we truly love somebody, we'll never finish with our grief. And that's just not true. If we truly heal, we will we will heal. And we will be finished with the active grief work that most therapists call it. Is there's is, grief is work. It takes work to accomplish. And so, you know, it if I link it to, if I really love this person, then I'll never be over them. And yeah, no, <laughs> um, because if I love this person, then I will take the time to heal and heal in order to what? Take what they have poured into me and then be able to pour it into other people as well. And that's that's a testimony to their love for us rather than I, I have to never be finished. There are plenty of people, my, my mom in particular, when I was growing up, that never really finished with her grief over my dad's death. And, and she would do things that we call mummifying, and I'll talk about this in the next episode. Um, but she was never done. She, she went to her grave, her own grave still grieving the loss of her husband. And so along with that is grief 
cannot be finished, another misconception that we carry with us. Yes, it can be finished, just like healing can from a broken bone. Uh, it takes time. It takes um, uh, some intentionality behind it. And sometimes it, it takes a guide to do it for us and to take us through it. Um, and then last but not least is the self-neglect is a part of grief. And usually self-neglect is not just for us. We may not have the energy to, to, to take care of ourselves. And, and that's understandable. I mean, I, a lot of times I've seen grief, you know, be misinterpreted as depression when in fact it's just grief and we don't have to pathologize it to make it valid. Um, it's, it's just, we're grieving and it's not, only that we're depressed. Now, I think there are plenty of instances where somebody who already struggles with depression goes into losing somebody or losing a dream or having a being somebody some part of their future be dashed and 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 to have that be exa uh, exacerbated by the depression that they have. But still, it, it self neglect is oftentimes in many ways a way to communicate to others how badly we feel rather than just simply communicating it ourselves with the words that we have. And so let me, let me end on, on this one last thought. And that is <clears throat> that how we handle our grief and our loss. Okay. And I'll say loss because I want to keep this uh, specific in the sense of loss through death, but I also want to broaden it to loss the other losses of our lives that we experience. But how we deal with it has a way of revealing things about us and clarifying our vision for what's really important in our lives. And that's, that's what's key here is the importance of talking about grief and loss isn't in choosing a sad subject to talk about. It actually is talking about life. And it's talking about life much more than we could possibly understand because of the investment in life. See, there's so much of what we do in life that is hedging our bets against what? <laughs> and usually it's loss. And so we, we control our emotions. We control our connection. We um, control how other people think about us in order to minimize the pain of the loss that we might feel. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let me let me end with um, this quote from Henry Nouwen, and and it real what it underscores. And I I don't I want to belabor these quotes because I I know that uh, you know they they kind of take us off track for a few minutes, but. Um, the thing that I want to help you understand is that we live lives of contrast. Happiness, there's sadness. Joy, there's sorrow. There, you know, there's good and bad, if you want to put it in big, broad categories. But this is what Henry Nouwen said. And Henry Nouwen was a fairly uh, well-known psychologist and priest who wrote about spiritual formation a lot. He probably... Um, some of his most popular books are things like The Wounded Healer or The Return of the Prodigal that are all very good, and I highly recommend them. But this is what he said. We need to remind each other that the cup of sorrow is also the cup of joy, that precisely what causes us sadness can become the fertile ground for our gladness. Indeed, we need to be angels for each other to give each other strength and consolation because only when we fully realize that the cup of life is not only a cup of sorrow but also a cup of joy will we be able to drink it. And it, it, it says it all. It really says it all uh, that I think is important to understand. We want to have a life of happiness and get rid of all the ugliness and the things that rain on our parade and make us sad and all that kind of stuff. But what we what we're doing is essentially we're creating a flat line life rather than a life with some topography of happiness and sadness and and uh uh you know a difficulty and adversity and success and 
all of those things that really do come together. So I'm going to stop at that point and uh, call it call it a day. Uh, just a couple things to remind you of, and I mentioned this at the top of the podcast. The book release date is January 16th. That is when you're going to be able to get your hands on it through Amazon. Um, and if you're interested, you certainly can find or pre-order it. We're still five days out here, uh, but you can pre-order it on Amazon. If you go to sgi-net.org uh, and look under um, the store, SGI store, it's at the very end of the menu bar top. Uh, you will find a link to be able to pre-order it on Amazon if you would so choose to do that. There is an event coming up in the near future, and I'll let you know as soon as I know uh, what the date is for a book launch party. So if you're in the Denver area, you can certainly come and join us for that. I will uh, be uh, signing books, and you can hear from my publisher, who is a good friend, um, and uh, also, I'll, uh, there are a few excerpts out of the book I'll probably read for people just to give them a taste of what is going into it. So if you have questions, feel free to DM me on Instagram. Um, when you hit the website, if you hit it for the very first time, uh, you will be encouraged to join the community. That's not You're not going to get spam or anything like that. That's just for us to be able to occasionally send out a, a newsletter to let you know what's going on and in the outpost <clears throat> and the groups that that are being formed. Also, I would encourage you to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, that only raises our profile uh, for people to find out more about what what we're what I'm talking about here and and uh, things like that. If you want a weekly devotional for uh, healthy relationships. You can also get that on the website. It's it's called Setting New Boundaries. Uh, and you will get a devotional once a week about healthy boundaries, healthy relationships, uh, what problems exist, what you can do about them, and how you can maintain them. And that's really how they run. So uh, you can get that on the website as well. It's a monthly subscription, it's a semi-annually one, annual one, uh, or a year one if you want to get one all, all year round, which would be 52 installments of it. So you can follow us on any of the social media outlets, Instagram at SGI underscore international, <clears throat> um, at Facebook, Ray.Mitch, M-I-T-S-C-H, and LinkedIn, Dr. Mitch, uh, and so um, the podcast can be listened to. Of course, here you are listening to it, so you know this already. On any of the outlets like Spotify or iTunes or Amazon Music or any of those usual culprits where you want to find that. If you're interested in partnering with us, we would be ever so grateful. We want to continue to grow the scholarship fund uh, for our silent retreats that we're doing for young people. Um, and all of your gifts are going to be tax deductible uh, to, to support us in whatever way you can. Um, I already mentioned about the book launch and uh, the, the availability of the book in Amazon is the 16th of, of January. If you want to promote the things that we're doing here, you can also uh, uh, order a window sticker. Uh, it, it is uh, entitled Esse Quam Videri. It's a Latin phrase for to be rather than seem. And uh, it will sh proudly show your support of what we're trying to do here at SGI. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, it, if you want to hear something a little different, uh, a former student of mine does a podcast called Care with Korak, and K Care is spelled with a K. His last name is a K, so uh, K-A-R-E, Care, with Korak, K-O-R-A-C, and uh, it can be found on iTunes or Spotify. It's also on the website if you want to listen to it there as well, so feel free to do that. Um, if you or someone you know would like to send us a physical check, we will not turn our noses up at that either. And so they can make the check out to SGI and then send it to P.O. Box 322, East Lake, Colorado, 80614. Well, that's it for tonight. Uh, we will... Uh 
come again in a week to talk some more about grief and loss and get into the seasons of our grief so that you understand a little bit of what's in the book and um, how you perhaps can use it even in your own journey through grief if that's where you're at. Thanks so much for joining me. And as always, love you. Later.
Well, welcome, everybody. Nice to have you. Thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule to listen in to another edition of the Outpost Podcast. I am Dr. Ray Mitch, your host, and uh, <clears throat> we're launching into a four-part series here for the month of January and a little bit into, into February, partly because of the release of my new book coming up called The Seasons of Our Grief, and that's what these episodes will be um, coming up. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, what is The Outpost? The Outpost is a podcast that explores the intersection of faith, psychology, and spiritual formation. We want to create a space where the doubters are wounded, the confused, the beat up and beat down, the bent and bruised who feel like their lives are a disappointment to God can feel accepted, accepted enough to be known and know others. Um, and we're, we're seeking to be a place where people can bump into the biblical Jesus. What they do with him is entirely up to them, but we want to be able to um, present maybe a little bit different picture than they're accustomed to. So that's that's what we're about. That's what the outpost is about, and um, uh, just creating a space to have some conversation around some, I think, important issues, certainly, of our spiritual lives. And one of those is... Um, the, the, the phrase I like to use is lament and lament is, uh, you find that in scripture in a lot of places. Um, and it's songs of sorrow is really what a lament is. And we've, we've moved away from that in our happiness addicted culture. So, you know, I, I am, I imagine people might be saying, well, why, why do a, a thing on grief and loss at the beginning of the year, because after all, we we want to start out with a happy, you know, happy uh, vibes that are going on and all that. And yeah, whatever. But <clears throat> I think oftentimes grief is something that we experience and we feel, but we don't talk about very much. And yet we feel it probably the most painfully over the holidays. And we're just coming out of those holidays. And I think there's a a bit of a emotional hangover after all of that. And I, I think it's worth having a conversation about grief and loss and not just loss to some somebody by death. There's more to loss than meets the eye. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about going into this particular episode. And then I'm, I'm going to unpack a little bit of what you would find in the book um, and I'll have the details at the end of the uh, episode for you to to know where to find it and uh, the the other kind of events that are going to be surrounding the release of the book itself. Well, welcome everybody to another edition of the Outpost Podcast with Dr. Ray Mitch. Um, obviously, I'm Dr. Ray Mitch. Um, <clears throat> And uh, what we're launching into here is a um, couple or a, a month-long series of um, th that uh, is going to help us be able to take a look at and talk about um, grief and loss in the new year. I, I think it's an important conversation to have. And to look at and to understand, and that is very much a part of um, what we're going to be looking at. 